morning. Welcome if you're watching on Facebook. We're glad you're with us. Let's all stand and worship and singing, um, Living by Faith. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love, safe from all. may blow and the storm clouds arise obscuring the brightness of life i'm never alarmed at the overcast skies the master looks on at the strife i know Live. that he safely will carry me through no matter what evils be tied why should i then care though the tempest may blow if jesus walks close by my side living by faith in Jesus above trusting confiding in his great love safe from all harm in his sheltering arm I'm living by and feel no alarm. Our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Our troubles will then all be o'er. The Master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Living by faith. Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love, safe from all harm, in his sheltering arms, I'm living by faith. on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me up to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by 
faith alone heaven's stable land a higher place that i have found lord plant my feet on higher ground lord lift me up and let me stand my faith on heaven's stable land a higher plane that i have found lord plant my feet on higher Offering this morning. So um, at any time throughout the service, you're more than welcome to, to come and bring your tithes and offerings to the Lord. We talked about today in our Sunday school class that praising God, that it's not just, just singing or, or humming a tune, um, but it's our prayers. It's our giving to the Lord to, to give back and just to say thank you uh, for all that he's, he's blessed us with. Let's, let's pray this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for, for all that you do for us each and every day, that, that just the little things that you do that probably often go unnoticed, you are there for us, that, um, and we just want to say thank you. And, and the offerings that we give, that, uh, that, uh, that they would be used to, to just continue to bless uh, and further uh, your ministry that um, to reach to reach others, Lord. Um, we just just ask that you just come and be a part of our service this morning, Lord. As we as we continue to sing and and uh, sing praises to you, Lord. In your name, we pray. Amen. church, one faith, one anthem raised, God and God alone, one cross, one grace, one name that saves, all praise to you belongs, Jesus, all praise. Yeah. 
have a prayer request just encourage you to come up at the altar uh, there's something definite you can pray there at your seat but there's something I don't know that your mind attaches to when you come and kneel at the altar you're reminded that's where you laid it down that's where God answered a prayer Lord this morning there are many needs Lord, we just are a people that are longing for a Heavenly Father to do a work, whether that is in us or maybe a close loved one. We are a people longing to see you move in a mighty way. We are praying that you help us to prepare our own hearts, that you would move in our lives. And Lord, for those that are close that we have been praying for, whether it's a loved one who needs a physical touch this morning or maybe someone that we have just been praying for salvation, we are asking for your Holy Spirit to move in and among us and through us to see miracles, to see people's lives transformed, to see people touched physically. And we know you can do it and we trust you and we believe you but you've also asked us to pray and that somehow in this communion with you, in this relationship, there is power. And so, Lord, we, we come together corporately as a body asking for your power of the Holy Spirit to move. Lord, prayer requests that are represented that we don't even know about, we are asking for you to move ahead and to begin dealing and moving in a way that would fulfill the will that you have for that prayer request. Right now, in the midst of life, in the busyness of it all, in the ups and downs, would you help us in this moment to stop time and to settle before you and just to hear you move. And Lord, my prayer this morning is that we as your people would say yes to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, you're getting old when you think this song is a newer song, and it was um, back in 2008 when it was written and played by Cutlass. So I just felt like it was just a couple years ago, and it was 2008. And I think somebody said that they were 11 years old when that was um, written. So um, this message this morning's on faith, and this song came right to my mind, What Faith Can Do. Um, beautiful words to it. I have them up there, too, so you can see them. Enjoy. Everybody falls sometimes. Gotta find the strength to rise from the ashes and make a new beginning. You're stronger, stronger than you know. Don't you give up now. The sun will soon be shining. Gotta face the clouds to find the silver lining. I've seen dreams that move the mountain. Hope that doesn't never end, even when.
so fortunate to have the praise team that we do and so many moving parts um, it just it just adds so much so thank you Angie and everybody uh, just real quick before I forget um, hold on here I got four pieces of paper why am I got four here oh because it's going to be a long one no I'm just joking I'm just joking uh, ladies retreat you're going to hear more about ladies retreat if you've never gone on ladies retreat we'll have someone come up and share but look in the bulletin that is coming up uh, even though it's in October you have to register before that and we'll be talking more about that later teen cookout following the service listen it doesn't matter if you brought some or if you didn't bring something they just want everybody to come back to say thank you if you want to give to help support you can but you don't have to we're just going to enjoy that time together so please stay for that and then also, Bev was sharing about Brenton. So we've been praying for him for quite a while. Um, I don't know all the details. I just know is they, they replaced part of his skull. They put that back on his head, and surgery went well. So continue to pray for him. He's up in Traverse City, and really just a miracle what they're able to do. Okay, draw your swords and turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Now, you know, families, all families are different. Not everybody's the same, so, and that's fine. That's fine. When our kids were little, uh, we would often read to them. We felt like reading was important. And so one of the things that we would do, especially on long trips, we would read the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. Did anybody else do that? Yeah? Yeah? Can we get some hands? So this is like his entire works. And it was awesome because you try to figure out the mystery, what's going on. And um, Caleb or Grace would try to get, all of us would try to guess what's, what's happening. Uh, Sir Arthur Doyle wrote this. I think he was born in like 1853. But there is a story where Sherlock Holmes wakes up unexpectedly in the middle of the night. 
And you know who his sidekick is, right? Watson. All right, Watson. And he wakes him up. Watson, Watson, get up. Well, Watson's half asleep, and he wakes up, and, and Holmes says, as the way Holmes does, is, what do you see? Well, Watson looks up, and he says, I see stars, stars upon stars upon stars upon stars. And Holmes says, well, what does that tell you, Watson? Well, Watson thought about it because he knew often Holmes was looking deeper into the meaning of things, and so he says, well, it tells me there are millions of galaxies, possibly billions of stars. It tells me meteorologically that it's going to be a nice day tomorrow. It tells me aurologically that it's about 3 a.m. in the morning. It tells me theologically that this is his creation, that there's a grand design, so there must be a creator and a designer of all this. Why? What does it tell you, Holmes? Holmes says, Watson, you fool. It tells us someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> okay, most of you got it. Good job. Sometimes we can miss the big picture. What about Noah? Did Noah miss the big picture? Now, if you think our times are confusing, think about what it must have been like in Noah's time when people lived extra long lives, which meant there was more time to be entrenched in sin, more time to learn bad habits, more time to be separated from God. It was a time when sin was so great, the earth so corrupt, that those who knew God so unfaithful that it says, Noah was the only one that could hear the voice of God. And it was in such a world that God would come to Noah and ask him to build a boat. So look with me this morning. We're going to start in uh, Genesis chapter 6. I'm actually going to go up to verse 8. Chapter 6, verse 8. It says this, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous and, and blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it. Coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark will be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Make a roof of it, finish it, uh, finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under heaven. Every creature that has breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I, I will establish my covenant with you. And you will enter the ark, you, your sons, and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you and will be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and stored away as food for you and for them. And Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. You know, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. We see the beginning of creation. God creates time. We see the creation of the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, vegetation, animals. We see the beginning of man where God creates man in his image. We see the beginning of the, the Hebrew nation. 
we also see the beginning of sin and the beginning of God's redemption story. But maybe most of all, we see the beginning of the cosmic battle of evil versus good. It starts with Satan in the garden who is described as the slithering serpent to now the time of Noah where his influence is on the world in such a way that it says every man's heart was corrupt and was full of violence and evil. It would be in the midst of this kind of world that God would come to Noah. Now it doesn't seem like things have changed very much over 4,000 years, does it? I mean, here we are, and we can explain things hourologically, meteorologically. We can have cars drive themselves. We can even, we can even see to the outer edge of the universe now with the JWT telescope. But we cannot answer the most basic questions of life. How did I get here? What's the meaning of life? How do you define truth? And we live in a world that just seems like it's out of control. Hmm. You know, um, a few years, the BBC did a study, and they asked, what is the number one problem in the world? And here was their conclusion. Corruption. And the question they came up with was, why is the human mind so corrupt? As we look at this story, we see that it's man's issue since the time of Noah. Man with a corrupted mind. Because it says everyone was filled with the wickedness, evil, violence, and corruption within their heart. Do you think it was hard for Noah to live in that day and age? Do you think it would be hard to live in that day and age? Let me ask you another question. Do you find it's hard sometimes today in the life that we live, in this world that we live? I mean, think about it. Since the beginning, when you start school, you are told if you go to a public school that you were created from nothing and you evolved. And if you think there's another way, well, that's okay, but just don't share it in the classroom. And if you're a teacher, well, you can pray, but you better not let your students pray or hear them praying for them, even though our founding fathers prayed all the time. And if, if you choose to, to vote, and you say you vote upon, upon Scripture or upon your conscience, someone will sneer at you and say, well, I vote on science, as if somehow your, your opinion doesn't matter or has value. Now, if we find it hard to live in this kind of world, which is also a world where we have the Scriptures where we have the Holy Spirit empowering us, where we have Christian music encouraging us, where if you move and you go into another city, you'll have no problem finding another church, where you have other fellow believers walking alongside you. How much harder do you think it was for Noah, who it says he was the only man living for God? You know, it must have been really lonely for Noah. You remember back when you were a kid or a teenager and you had to move? Did anybody have to move when they were a kid or a teenager? Anybody. One person on this side? Okay, we got three people, about eight people on this side. Well, a lot of you, God bless you. You didn't have to move. I only moved once, so it, was, it wasn't that hard. Carrie moved, I think, 18 times. Okay. She corrected me, 15. Well, quite. 
1815. Okay, um, there is a sense within a child, even a teenager, when you move, you think the world is going to end, right? Because everything is heightened. Uh, you, th there is something, and God creates inside of us that we want community, relationship, belonging. And when you come into another school, you have kids that have grown up with each other. And too often than not, like you feel left out. You don't belong. No one sees you. No one hears you. Now, usually, eventually, you make a friend or two. That might take a while, but it happens. Noah, there was nobody. Nobody. I can't even express how lonely it must have felt for him. When he would go into town... When he talked to a neighbor, he wasn't getting a friendly voice. He already knew ahead of time, this person is going to try to swindle me, take advantage of me. He doesn't like me. The corruption, the violence, it didn't matter where he went. There was nobody that was doing any form of good. He was a man literally by himself. Now look at this. Go to verse 8 for just a second. It's in the midst of this world that it says Noah found favor with God. And then in verse 9, he was righteous and blameless. And then it says, and he walked with God. Now I want to take each one. And if you like taking notes, here you go. I want you to underline the word found favor in verse 8. Okay? Underline that found favor. Here's what it means. It means to be accepted. I think Noah's life, by being alive and living for God, displeased everyone he came in contact with. It was a reminder to them that he was the last man worshiping God. Now, if my, if my math is right... Methuselah was still alive during Noah's time and he would die shortly before the flood. Now Methuselah would have been around are you ready for this? Since the time of Adam. Remember this is a time when man is living long lives and I don't, we don't have a lot of time to go into that um, it could have been because of the way God had created the atmosphere, uh, like a barometric chamber. Um, you know, athletes have those. It helps them to heal faster. It's pressurized, saturated with oxygen. Well, if we had some sort of bubble around us, um, it could create the same kind of environment. Now, it wasn't as if people are saying, oh, Adam's a myth. He lived so long ago. No. We are talking people living long enough that the story is going around talking about how God at one point walked with Adam. But by this time, it wasn't that God was a myth. They wanted to rid themselves of God. So here is, here is Noah. He's walking through town. The people want to rid themselves of their creator. And every time they see Noah, they see God, and they don't like it. But it says, but somebody accepted Noah, and that was God. Because of regardless of how people treated him, he was choosing to follow him. And you know, sometimes in our own lives, the people that are closest to us sometimes can ridicule us of our faith and make it very hard. 
I guess what I would say to you is this. If you choose, regardless of the pressure that's being put on you, to follow God and trust him like Noah, you too will find favor in his eyes. Now here's the second thing, and I want you to underline this. Noah was righteous and blameless. Will you underline those two words? He was righteous and blameless. Now here's the word for righteous. It means he was just before God and blameless means wholesome and complete in truth. Did you get that? So he was just and he was wholesome and complete in truth. Now, I don't know what you've been told, but Noah is an example of what can happen despite your circumstances or the world we live in or the evil surrounding us. Although the whole world was wicked, Noah chose to live with integrity and honor God. You know what's another word that's very similar to this? It's going to surprise you. Holiness. You see, God was doing something inside of Noah despite what was going on around him to live above his circumstances. How do you think Noah was able to do that? Here's my guess. Noah chose to keep his eyes on God instead of everything going on around him. I think sometimes we do the opposite. Instead of keeping our eyes on God, we keep our eyes on everything that is happening around us. And before long, we say, woe is me. Noah was living in obedience. Now, I want you to see this. As God, as Noah was doing that and God was doing something inside of Noah, making him righteous, making him holy, making him virtuous, restoring the character of man inside of Noah, I think his family could see it. Do you know nowhere in Scripture it talks about his family being holy and righteous and blameless? I don't think they were. But this is what I think. I think his family saw the life of Noah, saw the life of the people around them, and they said, we want to follow Noah. When you choose to follow God, I am here to tell you, it will affect those closest to you. As they begin to see a life that is living with integrity and honesty and being obedient to God even when it's hard. Now there's, a, there's something else that's happening here because it says this, and Noah walked with God. Now we all know that in the beginning it says that God walked with Adam in the cool of the day, right? That sound familiar to you? Do you know there's only two other people that I found in scripture that it says walked with God? Two, Enoch and Noah. In fact, Enoch, it says, Enoch walked with God and then was, or, a, <laughs> you should have saw the face Carrie just made. She thought I was going to call on her. Was no more. He was taken. Right? That was the relationship that he had with God, and I think God took him because the flood's about to happen. Do you know who Enoch's um, son was? Methuselah. Do you know who Methuselah's son was? Lamech. Do you know who Lamech's son was? Noah. That would make Enoch his great-grandpa. Now, I don't know, but here's my guess. My guess is Noah heard from his dad who heard from his dad who heard from his dad. God used to walk with Adam and they had a relationship and he talked with them 
just like you do a friend. And God has created us for this relationship. And Noah believed it and started living it. And he was the only man. The only man. You know, I, sometimes we think, well, what does this Christian life look like? Well, I got to go to church. Well, yeah, you do need to go to church, but not because you have to go to church. That's like a saying, I have to spend time with Carrie. Would, would your spouse like it if you said you had to spend time with them? Now, maybe some of you feel that way. I'm sorry. I, you know, if you feel that way, you feel that way, but it shouldn't be that way. You want to. You have devotions. What does that mean? That means I read my Bible. It means I ask God, what are you trying to say to me? That means I pray and I commune and I talk with him and I listen to him. All that is part of a relationship that God wants you to have. And he doesn't force you. You get to choose. So, so here's Noah. And all of this is happening. And Noah is living honorably before God regardless of the circumstances around him. And I think things are going pretty good. I mean, it's kind of tough. But then God says, Noah, I want you to build a boat. What? Can't you hear the questions coming? You want me to build a what? A boat? He might even said, what in the world is a boat? Now, are you ready for this? Because he builds the boat. The boat's like 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Do you know how big that is? Okay, I don't know what kind of boat you've seen or you've been on. It would be this, because I measured it out. You see the door back there? It'd be from that door, not to that door, not to the parking lot, but to the road. Door to the road, and it would be 40 Five feet high. Now you may not work with wood, but sometimes I dabble in it. And I've got what's called a planer and a joiner, which means I can mill my own wood, right? I can join them together, I can form boards, I can plane them and make them smooth. It takes me a long time. We're talking months. Now, obviously, I'm not working on day and night, but to build something small. How long do you think it would take if you're doing this stuff by hand to build a boat from the door to the road 45 feet high? A hundred years, literally. That's how long it took them. Now, here's a little side note, because people begin to, well, you know, that's just... That's, they didn't really make a boat. He couldn't make a boat that big. And, you know, that boat wouldn't withstand the water. Dr. Hong, in 1993, from South Korea, I don't know his first name, he was, um, he was asked, because he was a, a boat specialist, to look at the boat, put in Scripture, would that be able to withstand waves and be built because it, the, the, it was just so mammoth a wooden structure that is just beyond sometimes comprehension after his study and this is this is a quote i wrote this down it says this we have found that the proportions in this arc is carefully balanced that it gives stability Sea keeping and strength that if it was off a little bit or modified, the vessel but would be rendered unstable and prone to fracture, but at its current size, it could withstand 100-foot waves. And this is from a guy who believes life came from the water. Okay, so he's not supporting, trying to be a supporter of Scripture. He's just saying what is written is accurate. It could withstand 100-foot waves. It's, it's basically perfect in design. Hmm, interesting. But here was another question that Noah had to have. One was size. How in the world am I going to do this? The other is, where's the water going to come from? It wasn't like he was building this next to the water. 
Now, if he had trouble before, what do you think his neighbors were saying to him now? And Noah had his own questions. How in the world is this going to happen? Okay, are you ready for this? Just another scientific fact I find very, very interesting. Do you know on top of some of our tallest mountains, such as Mount Everest, do you know Mount Everest is now the highest mountain I've ever been on? Or I should say the highest I've been is 12,500 feet, which is pretty, I think it's pretty high. Mount Everest, 29,000 feet. To put it in reference, that is five miles from the ground straight up five miles and do you know what they found on the top of mount everest petrified clams in the closed position now a clam when it dies opens up which means it has to be buried alive rather quickly so it can't open up i wonder how that happened but you know, not water wasn't the only question. Here was another question that Noah must have had. How in the world are the animals going to get here? Noah had no idea that the animals knew the voice of the Creator and would obey his call. I wonder if this is what Noah was thinking. Lord, can't you send someone else to do it? Lord, can't you make this easier? Lord, this is going to be too hard. Lord, what's my wife going to say? Lord, what are the kids going to say? Lord, what are the neighbors going to say? I think there was a conflict in Noah's heart that the Scripture doesn't tell us about. And here it is. Is it going to be his will or God's will? Is it going to be God's plans or his plans? Is it going to be his way or God's way? And Noah had a decision to make. It was one thing to, to live for him and to believe in him, but now he was asking him to build a boat. Henry Martin was a man most people tried to avoid because of how he looked. He was full of warts, head to toe back of his hands, on his face, and even on his eyelids. He was covered with warts. It's fa in fact, it is said that um, he went to Cambridge, and often when there were social events or cricket was going on, because that's the major sport over there, he would be often found hiding behind a tree because he wanted to be around people, but he didn't want people to see him. But there's something else about him. He was a brilliant man. I mean, brilliant. And one day in one of his classes, a pretty young woman saw through the warts and saw his heart and saw his mind, and she fell in love with him. It was really kind of an odd sight as you looked at him. It's almost like a person... Um, a couple that are just way different. You would never pick, put these two together. But she saw through all of that. And she did something inside of his. His heart began to pound as he began to see himself the way God sees him. And being loved for who he is, not what he looks like. Well, he was also a really strong believer. And one day he was at... Um, a church service and there was a missionary speaking and the missionary was talking about the need for missionaries in India and translators and in the story Martin Henry he says this he says I don't know how to explain this but my heart began to pound inside of me and I knew God was calling me to India and so where do you think and who was the first person that he ran to go tell the love of his life, Lydia. And he knocks on the door and she opens it up and he bursts in and he starts talking so fast and so high and she's like, slow down, slow down. What are you trying to say? And she says, I don't know what to say other than this. God has called me to India. 
I feel so unworthy. But Lydia, after we are married, let us go to India where God can use us. Will you go to India with me? And Lydia point blank looks at him and says, no. If there is anywhere I will not go, I will not go to India. He was so moved by the speaker. He says, we have to go. What are you talking about? Let's go. And over the next several weeks, they talked, they argued, they debated. Finally, he said, listen, listen, just go for a little bit. Just go for a little bit with me and see what God's going to do. And she says, if I know anything, I have it inside of my heart. I will not ever go to India. And in his story, he says this. One night I was praying, and God woke me up in the middle of the night, and I found myself praying even while I was sleeping, and I was praying this, Lord, what's going on? How could you call me and not call Lydia? And finally he had this argument and this yelling session with God. Is it going to be Lydia or is it going to be India? Is it going to be Lydia or is it going to be India? Is it going to be Lydia or is it going to be India? When finally he realized it, and the Holy Spirit woke him up, and he realized it was never Lydia or India. It was always, is it going to be Lydia or God. And here's the moment for Noah, a moment of truth. Is it going to be his way or God's way? And in verse 22, it says this, Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. And he looks up toward heaven and he says, I will build the boat. I got a short video I want you to watch.